Discover the exquisite beauty of Islam with our exclusive poster collection showcasing the 99 names of Allah. Each poster meticulously presents the Arabic name, pronunciation and English translation, embodying the essence of our Creator. Elevate your surroundings with these high-quality designs that not only serve as art, but also offer a glimpse into the profound beauty of Islamic culture. Immerse yourself in the collection and unveil the magnificence of the 99 names. Links in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you knew man Ms. Bobby, guys, if you watched the previous video, I tried to find out what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ate during Ramadan, but I couldn't find any video at all. Most of them talked about the routine of Prophet Muhammad or what he ate in general and not during the time of Ramadan. So in the search of a video, I had no success whatsoever. However, I found an article on the topic, on the subject of what the Prophet actually ate during Ramadan. So today, inshallah, we're going to read it out together. Guys, before we start the video, leave me a thumbs up if you enjoy my work. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. All right, we're on the page muslimink.com and here, inshallah, we'll find out what did the Prophet eat for iftar. I already looked up what he ate for suhoor and it was simply dates and or water. So this was not too complex. So let's see now how he ate for iftar. Let's read. Looking at the abundance of food on our iftar tables, it never ceases to appall me how much time, energy, expense and effort is spent in preparing, consuming, serving and clearing up elaborate meals in the name of maintaining Ramadan traditions. Yes, and this is absolutely my experience as well. I reverted to Islam, alhamdulillah, last year. So this is my second Ramadan. However, growing up as a non-Muslim, seeing Muslims and how they would break their fast, it was absolutely disgusting. This had nothing to do with fasting whatsoever. When you're fasting, you're abstaining from food. And if you're fasting during the day, why would you then become a glutton at night and stuff your face with all kinds of junk food? It just never made sense to me. And looking at it now from a Muslim perspective, I can say this is clearly tradition. This is clearly culture and it cannot be religion because it goes against abstaining. It goes against the purpose of fasting in the first place. Let's continue to read. It makes me wonder who taught us the tradition of the overladen table and the distended stomach. That makes me wonder too. It was certainly not our Prophet wasalam, whose sunnah we are obliged to follow. Doesn't it strike us as hugely ironic that even as we make Ramadan resolutions to improve our acts of worship and strive to follow the sunnah in other areas of our life, we tend to conveniently overlook this aspect of the Prophet's life, his moderation to the extent of abstinence in indulging his appetite. Are we the Ummah of the Prophet who said the offspring of Adam fills no vessel worse than his stomach, sufficient for the child of Adam are a few morsels to keep his back straight. If he must eat more, then a third should be for his food, a third for his drink and a third left for air. Yeah, I'm very happy about this article because it confirms the questions that I had previously already. Isn't this about moderation? Isn't this about abstinence? How can you sit there and just eat cakes and burgers and kebabs and whatnot and act all righteous and spiritual? Isn't this a time of getting closer to Allah and not getting closer to food? Going by the statistics which state that cases of acute indigestion and a host of other digestive disorders increase by almost 48% all over the world at the beginning of Ramadan. It certainly doesn't seem so. Yeah, man, I remember this because back in the day when I was an Orthodox Christian, this is what Christians would make fun of. They would compare the two fasting styles within Christianity and within Islam and they would say, 
This is not fasting. They're simply gorging themselves. They're eating even more than they usually do. And then over the day, they pretend, oh, yeah, well, we are fasting now. This was really a matter of critique amongst the Christians. And I would say rightfully so. Because here you can see that digestive disorders increase by almost 48% all over the world at the beginning of Ramadan. And we of course know as Muslims that anything that harms your health is of course haram. So you cannot gorge yourself to a point where you are experiencing digestive upset or distress or whatnot. You are harming yourself. Okay, now the really interesting part for me personally, the Prophet's Iftar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For curiosity's sake, let's take a look at some of the things that the Prophet is reported to have broken his fasts with. The Messenger of Allah used to prefer breaking the fast with dates. And if he did not find any, he would then break it with water. This is exactly the same thing that I heard about Suhoor as well. That the Prophet would simply eat dates, and if he had no dates, then just drink a little bit of water before the fast starts. No mention of indulgent meals whatsoever. And as bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, said the Prophet wasallam used to break his fast with fresh dates before he prayed. If he did not find fresh dates, then he would use dry dates. If he did not find that also, he drank a few sips of water. Abdullah bin Afwa narrated, we were in the company of the Prophet wasallam on a journey and he was fasting. And when the sun set, he addressed somebody. Oh, so and so, get up and mix sawik, a coarse mixture of ground wheat and barley, with water for us. He replied, O oh Allah's apostle, will you wait till it is evening? The Prophet said, get down and mix sawik with water for us. He replied, O oh Allah's apostle, if you wait till it is evening. The Prophet said again, get down and mix sawik with water for us. He replied, it is still daytime. The Prophet said again, get down and mix sawik with water for us. He got down and mixed sawik for them. The Prophet drank it and then said, when you see night falling from the side, the fasting person should break his fast. Sahih al-Bukhari. There are many lessons to be learned from these narrations that give us an insight into the sublime character of the Prophet and the intended spirit of fasting. The Prophet preferred to break his fast with food that was easily available and did not disdain to break his fast with a few sips of water if there was no food. It was his custom to follow a simple, macrobiotic diet and he did not order special dishes made to break the fast with. I have absolutely no clue how he gets the idea that he was eating a macrobiotic diet because there was nothing mentioned here other than dates and siwak. Although there were some dishes which were considered delicacies in those days, like tarit, meat mixed with bread, talbina, a sweet, soups, vegetables, roasted meat, and dishes prepared with cheese and refined butter, which he enjoyed occasionally. The Prophet did not make a tradition of indulging his appetite, a fact which should give his Ummah plenty of food for thought. Whose traditions are we following when we sit down to our smorgasbord boards every day? And whose traditions are more worthy of being followed? Alright, and this is it for today's video. Unfortunately, there was not much more information in it either, but if you really think about it, I believe this is really what it boils down to. There is not an excessive mention of different foods because guess what? The Prophet wasallam wasn't eating in excess. Dates are mentioned over and over again and abstaining from foods. Whatever is around, he ate. He was a humble man, of course. He did not gorge himself. So if we say that we are Muslims and we follow the Sunnah of the Prophet, why don't we follow his eating habits during Ramadan? This truly reminds me of Surah Al-Baqarah. We read, and when it is said to them, follow what Allah has revealed. They say, rather we follow that which we found our fathers doing, even though their fathers understood nothing, nor were they guided. When the Quran was revealed, Islam went against everything within that pagan culture. People wanted to follow what their fathers were doing, but they had to abandon their culture and follow the true path of God. I believe we have to ask ourselves every single day what the true path of God is and what our ancestors have been teaching us. If I never would have asked that question, I would never revert to Islam because I had to examine 
what my forefathers did. I had to examine what my religion, quote unquote, taught us. I had to examine what those people before me followed. And after reading the Quran, of course, I had to compare it to what God wants from me. Nobody is exempt of that, no matter if you're born in a Muslim household or not. Tradition always finds a way to sneak into religion and pose as religion indeed. But ultimately, the question truly is, what did the prophet do? All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, leave me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out the links in the description box to further support my work. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace. Ya nafsu illam tadfari la tajza'i Ah